um, it's time to start. And welcome to the seventh historical building marker to be placed in downtown Oskaloosa. I'm Ann Brower, and I'm on the steering committee for the historical building marker project, along with Sherry Vavra and Calvin Banstra. Um, there are so many people that we need to thank that have made this project possible, but it takes a lot of time to thank that many people. I hope you all have a program and read, read about this project on your own if you don't know um, already all the, the people and all the tasks that have been involved in making this happen, but we're just thankful for this community project and it is in the truest sense been a community project. So we want to spend our time though today talking about this building, which is the Iowa Masons Benevolent Society Building. <laughs> so without further ado, we'll have our Mayor Dave come okay. up and Thank get you. us started. So welcome everybody for being here. Uh, my particular part of the agenda is just more or less the folks here. So thank you everyone. On the back of your uh, program is a listing of all the people that are involved on the committee. And this has been an, a project that I have a deep appreciation for. That people are taking their time. They care and they're showing their love for the community by doing this. And so we owe them a lot of thanks uh, as the project starts to wind up. Because really, and when it, what it comes down to is history, if it's undocumented, becomes history lost. And so these are the efforts that are being made for us to help remember that this is the foundation upon which we're all living today. So I think that this project has also helped us to appreciate the forward thinking of everyone that, that has built the buildings around the square. You know, helping us to kind of get into their mind, if you will, and see with their eyes uh, what the, the economy was like, what the culture of Oskaloosa was like, and how rich that was that they thought, yes, this is a good place to build a business. And we're also impressed with the designs themselves. The owners that, that built the buildings around the square, all of them had it in their mind they wanted to do this right. And so starting off with one or two, you all of a sudden have the bar set, where now you have to keep up with the elegance of that previous building. So you've got an owner who comes along and says, I think I can build a business here in town, and I think I want to build a building such as this, and says, okay, let's get her done. Hire an architect, someone who can do it right. Okay, but I'm going to have it be, in this case, an insurance company, but I'm also going to have some retail going on. So the architect is faced with a building that's going to have to serve multiple purposes, and yet also have to maintain some sense of elegance. And so that done, then comes along the worker who says, okay, if we're going to have this kind of design, my workmanship has to match the design. And so it stands as a testimony to those workers who have long gone uh, that these buildings have outlived everyone who laid hands on them when they were created. So as Ann mentioned, today we're in the Iowa Masons Benevolent uh, Society building. Uh, since its construction, there's been a lot of history here. And Calvin, I believe you're going to be up behind me talking about that. As suggested by its name, uh, they the Iowa Masons Benevolent Society saw a need, in this case a life insurance company for the Masons. They got organized, they worked hard, and constructed both a building and a business right here. And that spirit isn't that much different than what we're witnessing now in Oskaloosa. So you think about the optimism and the determination that we're seeing like with the construction of the early childhood um, uh, care and adult recreation center, that that one uh, being built is going to cost millions of dollars, but it's also a testament to the optimism and the strength that we think Oskaloosa has. You can look to the hotel that's being built on the west side of town. You can look to the local businesses that are going through expansions right now. All of that is expressing an optimism and a determination that Oskaloosa has what it takes in order to be successful. And I think that's what I appreciate the most, is that it's happening here in Oskaloosa. And so, in this case, the Seaframes did the same thing. We're back during the dark days of the farm crisis. You know, you've got a building that is, is it being foreclosed on, and so they stepped in, purchased it, not allowing it to deteriorate in the downtown square, keeping it up, keeping it looking good, keeping it, the bar set so the rest of the buildings will look good with it. And it's that kind of appreciation that I have as mayor to be able to look to them and say, on behalf of Oskaloosa, Lyle and Becky, thank you because we really appreciate the work you put into it. Thanks, Dave. 
I am going to stand up because I always like to look down on people. <laughs> so if, uh, if everybody in that back corner can't see, you can maybe stand over there a little bit too. So just feel free to mill around where you can get there. So this is the, we're going to do the, the first time we're going to have Ann be running the PowerPoint and I'm going to be talking about it. So if you see some crazy hand signals, that's what, what we're doing there. So. It's a mouthful of a name, the Iowa Masons Benevolent Society Building. So I'm going to probably call it the IMBS Building as we, we go through that. Um, the, it's, you see there's two addresses and there's two dates. And the interesting part about this building is that it was built in two sections. And those were the dates that it was completed. It was actually the one side was started in 1883 and completed in 84. And the other one was started in 1892 and completed in 1893. So if you want to go to the next slide, we're going to first talk about the two, two sides uh, so you can see the end result and then we'll see how we got to that, that point. So the architectural style of this is a, another mouthful. It's called a commercial building which possesses a mix of Italianate and Victorian Romance elements. So when this building was built, it was built shortly after the courthouse, and you can see that it was kind of carbon copied. You've got the two colors of the, the two types of brick with the, the red and the white. And if you look over the windows, the arch is very similar to the arch on the middle row of the windows there. And that's kind of the Victorian Romance style that goes with it, this building. When you first see it, you think it's even halves, but it's not quite. If you can look way to the top, those under the eave, they call those corbels that, that hold up that overhang. On the east side, there's five of them, but on the west side, there's six tells you a little bit about the, the length of the building on the west side is just a, a little bit, bit longer. And then also if you look at the corner of the arch of the top window to the center, you'll see that's very short on the east side. You go the west side, you look at the corner of the window and go to the center, it's a lot longer. So you can see that, that the sides are a little bit different that goes to the uh, different um, um, times when it was built. The windows are centered in both cases as well. Now let's flip to the side view of the building, which is the next slide. This is where the, the, the part that comes in, the Italianate comes in. You'll see on the, the east side, those are very narrow windows. And that's an Italianate style that you have the narrow windows there. And then you look at the corner at the top, there's a very ornate bracketed cornice. And again, that's an Italianate feature. <coughs> I don't know if you can see it very good, but on either side of the windows, there, there's, uh, there, I'm sure there's an architectural term, but I call it an H. Can you see those H's that are indented there? The one on the east side is very <coughs> narrow. The one on the west side of the building is very large, fat, and wide. And again, that tells you to the different sides of the, uh, the sizes of the building. Okay, the next slide will show another interesting feature of the building, and that, that's at the top. And I don't know, you can first see that they put IMB Society in there forever, that you will always see that that's how it was named. At the top, it's a shield or a shell. I am not quite sure. And then, of course, the lion is very prominent. I am not sure if those are Masonic features or not. You also have what, what I call kind of the sunburst on either side of the lion. They show a, a, a sun coming in and also on either side of the IMBS society. And then you've got the little rosettes that are there. So very ornate that was done at the time. Sometimes when we build, build buildings now, we try to do it as cheaply and as economically as possible. But in this case, there are some extra dollars and some extra time that was put in. The next slide will show what the, 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 where it's located. This is a plat of the, of the property. And what's in the yellow is the, the, uh, the, the lot that it's on. So the next, if you hit the next button, it was lot eight of block 13. And then continuing on that, you'll see the lot was 60 feet wide and 120 feet long. And then if you, if you just want to hit the next couple of them there, the storefronts were usually 20 feet wide, so you could get three storefronts per, per lot. 
And the first person that was on there was a guy by the name of Ebenezer Perkins. Now he has a great uh, uh, impact on where this, this town is. He was one of three commissioners um, selected by the state of Iowa to locate the county seat of Mahaska County. They picked three people from other counties because they didn't want infighting because there was always a huge competition where you could get the county seat. So he was one of those that came from Washington County. He must have picked where he liked it because he decided to stay. And he built a two-story um, general store on the corner, on the 20 feet, and he lived in the rear part of the corner, and that, uh, the, the rear part of the, the property. And again, that was very common for them. Next button. Next to him was a guy by the name of Samuel Ingalls, and he kept the post office there. Um, he was appointed postmaster in, in 1849, and he also lived behind in a house behind the building. We can see a little bit about Samuel in the next slide. I figured that I would put him in if you're ever having a bad hair day, <laughs> you're not going to be as bad as Samuel. <laughs> There's going to be one other interesting thing about Samuel that I've never seen before. If you go to the next bullet point, you can't really see that that's a gravestone of his daughter. And I tried to enlarge it, and I'll see if you can read it. If you can't, I'll read it. Can you see what the daughter's first name was? Next slide. He named his daughter Mahaska. So that showed what a, what a huge uh, affection he had for the, this area coming here. Mahaska Bell was her really name, so it has Mahaska B on that, that side. If you go to the next slide, we talk about the Iowa Masons Benevolent Society. Now, when you, you heard in the introduction, we've done uh, several buildings already. Some of them are named after their function, like we have the courthouse, for example, or we have the fire station. Some of them are named after kind of symbolic, so like we have the Iowa building, we have the, the, the trolley place, uh, we have the Centennial building just down, down here, and then we have buildings that are named after people. We have the Frankel building, and under the trolley place we have three names. We have the Fitch building, the McGregor building, and the Malcolm building. This is the only building that I know that was actually named after an organization. So then the question is, what was that organization? Next bullet point. It was a, an insurance company that was organized in Oskaloosa in 1876, so, so the year of the centennial of the, uh, of, the, of the country. You'll see that there were some big names that were part of that. Isaiah Frankel, who had the Frankel building. Um, another big name was H.C. Lighton, who owned the Herald. And there were two Civil War heroes that were also part of that. It was J.W. McMullen and F.H. Loring. Remember those two names because they will come, come back later. Next bullet point. Insurance in that area was a big luxury that very few people could buy if you were the common person. So it was very common for groups to get together, form a society, organize and spread the uh, financial risk. So you would see, in many cases, they would do it by ethnic groups. So you have the, the, the German-American Insurance Society, or the Bohemian side. Um, you could also have um, a religious ones, like Lutheran Brotherhood is still an insurance agency today. Sometimes you can even combine them, because there was an Irish Catholic um, Insurance Society. And sometimes also even by um, a trade, like there was the Tinsmiths Insurance. Um, what we have here is the Masons, which was a, a part of a, a lodge, and you also had the Odd Fellows and the Modern Woodman, and I think that's an insurance company that exists today yet, the Modern Woodman Insurance. So the next slide, they were not officially organized with the Freemasons, but because lodge, lodge membership was so strong in that day, it was, that it was to your benefit to try to identify with them because you could get a lot of members. It was almost like if you had opened a business in Iowa City today, if you got the name Hawkeye, you would probably attract people. And they did the same thing there, calling it the Iowa Masons Benevolent Society and targeted Masons. And if you could get a few Masons in, they would tell it to other Masons and it would tend to grow that way. Next bullet point will show how fast it grew. In two years, it had a thousand members. And the way that insurance company would work, that you would buy a kind of a low life insurance policy, low dollar amount, at least for our era, one or two thousand, 
you would pay a small monthly fee up front, but as people died, you would get assessments. And those assessments would roll into the fund, and then they would pay the $1,000 policy or the $2,000 policy. Next bullet point. In 1883, the, I don't know for sure where they were located prior to 1883, but they purchased what was known as the Perkins Corner uh, here for $5,000. And the Herald at that time reported what a great place that was because it was so visible. And you'll see that when we open the slide up to how visible it was. When Teddy Roosevelt campaigned here, you could see that, that he made sure that it was in front of this building because that was a, a focal point to come here. The next bullet point was that the board, board of directors voted to build a structure not to exceed 12,000, and that was the first half of the building. The next slide will show what kind of that looks like. This is from what's called a Sanborn fire map. There was a fire insurance company that mapped all the towns and would do that so they would know what kind of risk they had on the fire. So what you'll see, this is the first building that was three stories. You'll see a three in the corner of the yellow that went all the way back. The next five 20-foot foot, um, storefronts were all under one roof, and that was called the Union Block there. And they even noted that that was under one roof. And it's interesting when you look at the, the, the businesses, you had hardware in the two sides here. The next one was not only jewelry, but it was fancy jewelry. In there. <laughs> you had books, you had dry goods, which is another word for textiles, and then you had a cigar factory in the side. You'll see there that there's a three in front of each of the, those, those uh, buildings, but they were three stories only on that first half. You'll see up behind there, they were all one stories, and those were likely the homes where the business owners lived in at, at, at the time. Go to the next, oh, this, and also here is probably the only picture that we have been able to find when it was just one half. This came from a letterhead that was on a, uh, a, a, a letter that was being sold on eBay that, that somebody from the society was written. Again, you can see the, the ornate at the top on the woodcut that they have here. And then they had IMB Society written along the, the side. And then the next bullet point that comes up, this is the emblem that was with this. Now, it looks like a terrible bunch of letters, but if you look closely, you'll see that the I goes up and down. And then the Masons is the M that's in the back. The B comes out over the, there, and those are the points of the B, and then there's an S going all the way around. So it can make you a little bit dizzy when you're trying to figure out all of the letters, but they all are in there. They'd have that on the paternal swords, too, on our handles. Okay. So the next slide showed that it continued to grow. By 1982, it had over 4,000 members, so, so very, very rapid growth. So what happens when you grow? Next bullet point, you expand. They bought the neighboring lot here that was owned by Charles Huber, and they purchased that for 7000 That was that, that, that three-story, that was that side of the union block that was next door to it. Next bullet point, the paper reported that the new building would be an exact duplicate of the IMB Society block, which was that, that was called over there. The basement the first floor and the third floors would all be rented by Huber and Kalbach. And that was a big, big retail and wholesale hardware store that was located right on this corner. And we'll see another picture of that, that coming up, up later. Huber and Kalbach got a 10-year lease for those three. The second floor contained offices. The person in charge of the building committee was a guy by the name of Ben McCoy. And his name lives on in the, the law firm of McCoy, Faulkner, and Brewerman. And I see Mike here, that, that he is the, the remnant of that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. And it was, I think, called Bolton and McCoy at that time. But when, when he announced in the paper, he said, we will get this as fast done as fast as we can. I'm not going to put a date on it because I don't want to be held responsible. So typical attorney, you know, saying, saying that. 
Okay, if you want to go next, I think this is the oldest picture that I could find of the two buildings together. You can see the Huber and Callback across at, at the top of, of there. And then you can't see it there, but it also says that uh, the Abstract Company, Johnson Abstract Company, that was the card that was given for there. Um, the callback got, guy was pretty smart. Huber only had one daughter, and he married him. So the, 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 that's why the business became Huber and Callback, and, and that, that was there for many, many years. Okay, we can go to the next slide. There became some signs of trouble shortly after the building of the building. The first bullet point will point that out, that the Articles of Incorporation were amended. And what that amended was, it allowed to be consolidated with another insurance agency. Now you probably wouldn't do that if you were growing and everything was going fine. So that to me is the first sign of a little bit of difficulty. The next sign was they started borrowing. Now, as a banker, you kind of like it when they borrow, but not when you're in trouble. And that's probably what happened here. They borrowed 9000 from the Iowa Life and Endowment Association. Now, what was that? Believe it or not, that was another insurance agency in Oskaloosa. And it was uh, managed by a guy, I don't know if I pronounced the right name, Searle or Surly, who also owned an abstract company here, here in, in town. Then... They, just a few months later, they borrowed 5000 from Lizzie McNeil. Anybody heard of the McNeil Stone Mansion here in town? Mm -hmm. She is part of that group that, that had, had that. What I think what was happening was that as members became dying so fast, they had to raise the assessments. Well, some people said, I don't want to pay those assessments. I've only paid a buck a year for that. I don't care if my policy lapses. And they were running out of cash. So on June 24, 1896, they consolidated the insurance operations with the Equitable Mutual Life Association of Waterloo. And they operated under the Equitable Mutual Life Association name. The next bullet point was said, showed what they did was, a few months later, they raised more cash. They sold the building to Equitable Life Insurance in Waterloo for 40000 bucks. Yes. That's a little heading from there, and it shows that George W. Harbin was president, and remember what I said, that F.H. Loring, he was secretary of I, the IMBS Society, but he also became secretary now of this, this newly merged organization. However, they didn't really find the best partner, as you look at the next bullet sign. Equitable Mutual failed just three years later. The state shut them down. A receiver was reported to, to wind up the affairs. And then one of the reasons why, in the next bullet point, the president was accused of taking the association's money, 130000 And I guess if you think in those days, what, what that, that would do. So then a mess happened. There were all kinds of court actions up in Waterloo with, with the, the, the bonding companies being sued to try to get the money to collect that loss. But there was also a bunch of court actions here. The first bullet point was the members, the existing members of the IBM Society sued Equitable to say they could not have sold the building. They said that deed was invalid. And the reason it was invalid, it said the officers and directors were never authorized or empowered to execute the deed. The judge looked it over and he declared that was true. One of the reasons was Equitable never fought it. I think that Equitable was in all kinds of problems of their own. They, did give, they gave no defense, so the judge declared a receiver for the IMB Society and said it was insolvent. That receiver was the other Civil War hero there, that J.W. McMullen that had started the, the business way back in 1876. Well, the receiver of Equitable, who was from the state, said, hey, you can't take that building. We need that, that 7000 to pay all the people up at Equitable. So they put a 7000 judgment on the, that building. <coughs> the Iowa Life and Endowment Association started a foreclosure action and asked that the lien from Equitable's receiver be named inferior to that $9,000 mortgage, if you remember that happened back. Well, then... The, uh, some, uh, another thing that happened then was that those class action of the, those members 
they said, well, we're not going to sue Equitable anymore because it doesn't exist. We are going to sue the IMB Society and Iowa Life and Endowment. And the, after all of those things, finally, in February of 1901, the judge ordered the building to be sold and settle claims. So if you look at the next slide, this is that, that, that Loring. This is the individual that went from, from Oskaloosa to, to, to Waterloo. And before he died, he was a very, very prevalent Mason. He was very involved in that. And this was a quote that he had in the next um, uh, there. He said, the uniform kindness and courtesy extended to me and mine by the Masonic fraternity has been among the brightest and most pleasing episodes of a much checkered life. So no, most people would not describe themselves of having a much checkered life, of course, unless you're the mayor of Oskaloosa. <laughs> but, but you wonder if some of those transactions that were happening, a, a business that he started and then he hooked up with that Waterloo thing is one of the reasons he maybe had a little bit of regrets there. So, this very building was sold on the courthouse steps on April 15, 1901 to, for 28200 28, to a guy named Warren Johnson. Now, Warren Johnson was a, a individual that, that had a foundry here in town, and he was kind of well known for being a bottom feeder. He would often buy people that were, were, were struggling and bought mortgages that were past due and did those kind of things. His business, after a couple different trades, became ideal manufacturing and supply. And that's probably something that people will remember from around here. Now, his gravestone is one of the most interesting that I've never seen. If you want to click on that, I have, he was a bachelor. So he, I have never seen anybody put their career on their gravestone. So has anybody else seen that before? He called himself a machinist. So I, I thought that that was very interesting to, to, to do that, died in 1932. He only owned it, if you go to the next bullet point, for four years. He sold it for 40250 So he made a little money on that during that time to the Williams Brothers. And the Williams Brothers, if you go to the next point, that family owned it for 82 years. And so that what brings us to what I call the modern history, and I'm going to have Lyle speak a few things on that, but before I go to, to that, one of the things of the modern history is people remember Alsup's as being a, a business, <coughs> that, that long-standing business here in town. This hat was purchased at Alsup's by my grandmother in, in, in 1955 for 12 bucks. More than what she paid for some dresses, my, my mother said. So, so if you remember when hats were worn in church and you were kind of, that's where you wanted to put your money. This was, was her hat. And then another thing that walked through the doors of this was a necklace. This was my mother's wedding um, um, necklace. It was purchased in uh, 1962. And I came along in 1963, but it was more than nine months after that. <laughs> so just so that she knows that, be happy with that. And then there were two matching earrings that, that came from Alsace. If you want to, we're, we're working on putting, uh, Emily is, is an Alsup, and uh, she has a wonderful uh, um, interview that's now on YouTube that we're putting on the, the, the Chamber website. And I think that's going to be there maybe by the end of the day. So, so be looking out for that if you want to see that. So, so that ends the old history. I'm going to turn it over to Lyle now to talk a little bit about some more modern things. Well, thank you very much, Calvin. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Okay yep. mm -hmm. <laughs> well, we've got some special guests. We didn't know that McCoy was going to be involved here. Thanks for stopping by. Did you want to get an abstract or did you really want to come to the program? <laughs> <laughs> we'll get you an abstract. Anyway. Well, Emily, we're sure glad you're with us and we're going to talk more about you after a bit. But we've got some other people here that we want to, want to talk about a little bit. Uh, Edna Beal was not able to come. Uh, she, we'll talk about her in a little bit. She was with Johnson Abstract when it was upstairs in 1958. She was started work there uh, out of high school and she started there, then left here, and then she was with us and moved back here. 
There's a couple other people standing back there. Stacy Nelson, she wants to step out in front and be part of it. There's Lori back there. Lori. Where's Stacy Gleason? I'm sorry. Lori, Lori back there. When we moved here in 1995, those two gals came with us and they're still with us. So we're proud of that and thank you very much for doing that. There's, there's three things about this building that stand out to me that are that is unusual and different. And <coughs> Calvin has talked about those a little bit. Oh, I had another person I wanted. I wanted to do this because he needs help. And that's Mayor Crutzfeld. I think he is one of the best mayors that Austin has ever had. He is the mayor now. And I think the rumor is that he's up for re-election next week. And I'm going to go vote for him, and I suggest all you vote for him. <laughs> but the construction that was built in the two halves and, and et cetera, that's very unusual. And we had bought the building and started remodeling and started measuring and didn't take very long that this side was bigger than the other and well, what's going on. And so we found that out very quickly. Uh, Another thing was that it was uh, long time ownership. It's very unusual in a building like this, I think that's owned for 82 years, and this building is 138 years old and it's only had five owners. And one of those was a foreclosure guy. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, a very unusual situation. The, uh, <clears throat> was built in the 83, and Sutton and Weatherall was the contractor of construction guys. And Weatherall isn't Weatherall hidden. He built a lot of buildings around here. You never mm -hmm. mentioned that or whatever. But, but Emily Russell, our guest of honor here, had a big part in this building, or at least her family did. From her, from the film that you put together that's on YouTube, I've watched that a couple times and gathered some of this from here, so thank you for that and thanks for doing that. She's done a very good job of putting that together. Her family was running a department store in Frankel, Missouri. Her father died and her brother, or her, uh, her grandfather died, I'm sorry, and her father <coughs> was only 19 or 17 years old and had not finished high school. And so he started managing a store in Frankel, Missouri, and he never did finish high school. So and that was an all-sop store in Franklin, Missouri, and they came here, and he came here in 1920 to do that, and uh, he was 25 years old uh, after he'd run that store down here, and he came here and he went to work for the Frankel store. There's, that was Franklin, Missouri, but this was the Frankel store over here. He came here to manage that for them. He did that for 10 years, and then he went to the Oppenheimer and worked with them and joined them as a partner. They sold out to Sears. He worked for Sears out of Des Moines, and, and uh, Emily went to Des Moines and lived in Des Moines with her family for a couple of years, then and come back here, and in 1932, no, 1930, 30, yeah, 32, he came here and bought this building. No, he, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, that's totally wrong. He came here and opened the Frank, uh, opened the Alsop store, but leased the building, <coughs> never sold. He leased the building and started the Alsop store. And so during that time, it was in the middle of the Depression. He came here and took that big risk that nobody wanted to do anything and started this store. But from Emily, we find out that in the back there was a beauty shop. There was also a balcony in the back, and I didn't know that or that being there. In our remodeling and everything, I never found any remnants of that or anything. Uh, as I remember, and I think it was still here, right here, somewhere right here is where you went into Brady's Shoes, wasn't it? Right, right, right on here. Yeah, right here, Brady's Shoes was here on this side. And I assume he leased that to Brady's Shoes. Your father was not part of Brady's Shoes. That's it was correct, the, the beauty parlor. Was he part of the beauty parlor? <laughs> yeah, I mean, at least I think that was that was characteristic. They lease out some areas to to other people. There was a dress shop on the second floor, and there's dressmaking up there. I think you said, and, and what have you. The third floor was was offices of formal wear. Well, in 1959, her father Charles R. Alsop 
was 70 years old and passed away. And Carol and his brother came in and he took over the store and ran the store until 1971. And Carol was a, and Amy talks about this, Carol was a graduate, a business graduate of Harvard University and her dad hadn't finished high school, but they got along. <laughs> Another thing I, I didn't realize, and this is a side note, that Carol built the other Frank Lloyd Wright house here in town, the one on the, oh, I didn't, okay. yeah, I didn't realize that neither until I had Jason on this. So uh, this is where I, you got anything you want to add to any of that, Emmy? No, you've done it pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to know more, you need to watch this on YouTube. It's really good. Well, in that time, then, on the second floor was uh, another thing, and, and I want to, at this time, thank somebody because he came in here a while ago with more. There's a guy by the name of John Jacobs, is a Mahaska County historian, and here's the old newspaper articles that he gave me that I and Calvin have got a lot of information there. There they are back. Thank you. John came in here with a new one and he just found that there was, what is it, a 7,500 pound safe that was on the second floor in this building. Wow. And, and I would assume, and I wish Edna was here, I would assume, did you know anything about that safe up on the second floor? Well, I knew there was a big safe up there. I yeah, was it, was it over where Carl Johnson yeah, would have used it? Where, yes, right. That's what I figured. That's the reason Carl Johnson was up there. That's where he kept all the abstract stuff. And so he was up there on the second floor. Edna, like I said, came to work with us, and, and she moved in here with us in 1995, but she had started working up there in 1958. And then she had moved over to the Pillar Building, and then we came back and looked at the ground. But what was the entrance to those office buildings upstairs? There was a stairway on the outside was the entrance to those office buildings. It was up there, and that's where you went up to the Carl or the Johnson Abstract and insurance building there. Talked to Edna about that and she said there was no air conditioning, there was no typewriters, it was just carbon paper. <laughs> and uh, Emily also talks about that Carl Johnson got to be elderly and he couldn't make the steps and there was an old elevator in the back and her dad cut a hole in the back door, made a door in the back and let her let Carl Johnson go up the elevator and come into his office from the back. <coughs> Ask Edna about that, and she didn't even know. <laughs> so that was you didn't want that to be a public known. You just he could use that, what have you. I don't know whether you, any of you know these names. I got this from, from Edna, but did any of you know Eileen and Janice Young or Marjorie Doolin? They were employees up there. I don't know. I don't know anything about those people, but I just mentioned those names that somebody that was working up there. Well, you come up those stairs and you go in the door and to the right was, or to the north, was Johnson Abstract. But if you come up those stairs and you go to the left, was your competitor. <laughs> That's where Harold, Gerald Hessling started office. He came there in 1954 and he was in the southeast corner. I think his brother was younger, wasn't he? He came a little bit later, a year or two later. Harold? I think. I think that because he came there by himself like two years later or something, his brother came. But he said at that time, this was in 1954, every attorney in Oskaloosa was on the second floor. And I think that's typical of most, most towns. He rented that from Carl Johnson. Carl Johnson evidently was running the second floor or something, but he rented from Carl Johnson and paid $50 a month for that front corner. But he had a window air conditioner. That was probably at his expense. <laughs> but at the same time, there was one toilet room for both Johnson Abstract and Hessling's office up there. There was one toilet room was all. Well, today, we can't have a business like that. How would handicapped people or anybody like that get up to that office building? So I, I asked Gerald, I said, what did you do with the elderly people that couldn't make the steps? Well, this, we wouldn't hear it doing it today. He met them in their home or he met them in their car. He came down and that's how he handled that situation. So, you know, that, that probably was common, I would assume, probably doing that. In 1963, he moved out and he was the second attorney to move to a ground floor office. Then along, 
Emily's mother died in 1971, right? Mm -hmm. in, in 70. And Carol decided he didn't want to run the store anymore or whatever, and it was a family decision that they would sell the store. <clears throat> and Kenny Pixley <coughs> bought the store. I don't know whether any of you knew Kenny Pixley. It's Tenny. Tenny. Tenny Pixley. It's Tenny, huh? Tenny. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm sorry. <coughs> I, I knew David Ahmed because David Ahmed was in my son's class in high school and used to hang around our place and everything, and then he was around town, just left here a few years ago, and that's how I knew Dave Ahmed. So I talked to Dave Ahmed and gathered a few things that, that he remembered, and one of the things he remembered basically, because he was a kid in junior high school, that there was a pop machine you could buy up on the second floor, you could get pop for 10 cents, and came here at school and got a bottle of pop. You know? <laughs> but, uh, his father, or his stepfather and his mother, had been in retail in Tucson and Dubuque before they came here. One of the things he, re he says he remembers is the nice employees that they had here and the customer base. He was, he was really, he just couldn't believe the loyalty of the employees that was in this store and the customer base. The customer base was wide and far. I've got a friend that, <coughs> known for a long time that came from that didn't know at that time, but she came from down from Seymour, Iowa, which is west of Centerville. And in 1972 she came to this store to buy her wedding dress. That's how what that's how far this store reached out. Right. It's a long ways away to come through Centerville, right? It's about the same distance to Des Moines, I suppose, from there. But <clears throat> Kenny Pixley came here and he he did not buy the building, he leased it from the, from the brothers again, or from their estate, and he put an elevator, the elevator that was there was an old cable elevator, and he put the self-service elevator that's in there now. He also tuck pointed the building at that time when he came here. When he, before that, there was a gal by the name of Ruth Boulders. Did you remember <coughs> Ruth Boulders? She was the elevator gal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and she'd ran the elevator forever, you know, which floor, whatever they say, you know. And she was really concerned when they was put in the elevator. Because <laughs> she'd ran the elevator forever. But, but Tenny Pixley, he was certain that she and he found her another job in the store and kept her along. <clears throat> And Brady Shoe was still here at that time, with Kate, but moved out. Well, I think well, Kenny Pixley had the thing. Uh, so he ran this until then. They moved to the mall, and after they moved to the mall, then it became for sale. And Jerry Estel, or it was I think Town and Town and Country Town and, Country, Town and, Country, Town and Country Homes was and he bought it, and he used some government programs, and he. He took all that upstairs out, including the 7,500-pound safe, I would guess that's probably when it came out of there, and put four apartments on the second floor. And those four apartments are there. We've updated them a little, but not a lot. They're, they're pretty nice apartments. Uh, on the third floor, uh, we have, there's been an apartment up there. There's been a dance studio up there. There's uh, been a daycare up there. We've been, it, currently, it's vacant. We're working on putting another apartment back up, in up there, but haven't got to it with everything. So we bought the building then from, from Jerry Estel after Oskaloosa Home Loan and Bob Cook. that's a name probably some of you remember. Uh, he had a loan on the building and he was wanting to get rid of the building. He didn't want to run the building. He didn't want apartments upstairs. And so we bought it from him in July 5th of 1920. 95. In fact, Becky is the one that, that her name is the one, she's the one that owns the building. <clears throat> we remodeled it and moved MTGA along with the gals back there that I was telling you about and Hawkeye Real Estate over here on Labor Day weekend in 1995. And I remember it was, we had a holiday <coughs> because people wanted to come get their abstract but they were closed. You know? So this is one of the few times we're closed. <laughs> <laughs> Curtis Architecture, if you know Rod Curtis that's done the designing outside, he got his start in the basement in this building. I, I knew his father and he came here and anyway we made a deal and he came here and he got free rent for being my free architect. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so he worked with me and he's the one that put the design, we, we, had, we had 
done a lot of work, but not like it is now. And he is the one who put the plan together that is the building is now. It was during, and this, I thought it was 10 years ago, and when I looked it up, I found out it was 2002. Well, that isn't very long ago, but that's 17 years. And, and during that time, he was the one, we, or we, we was working here and started digging down, and there had been tile down and, and linoleum, and, and then every time they put down carpet, then they put down a layer of quarter inch plywood so they could put the next one on top of it or whatever it was, you know. And we took out nine layers, and we had kind of messed around, but found this floor that is it is here now, down here. Do you remember, was this, was it carpet? Do you remember what it was, Emily? Or? I, I, I don't remember. Yeah, yeah. It was carpet. Or yeah. Like that. yeah. When Essel had put in some old gray carpet over the whole thing, <coughs> just covered it all up, some old gray carpet. But that's kind of an interesting point. You need to get your abstract? Okay. Good. Good. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but uh, the uh, that's some of the things that we've done to it. I believe we tuck pointed the thing again. The elevator was outdated, they said, but it didn't meet safety standards and we had to redo it here a couple years ago and there's there's continually ongoing things. Put a roof on this building twice already since we've owned it, and so it, there's continually ongoing things that go on. I, I need to. Uh, there's. There he is. Step out here. Come here, Justin. Justin, go out there. Go ahead. Right. This is Justin Hunnell. He's our maintenance guy, and if it wasn't for him, we. He's one that helps us keep this building together and keeps things. When, when the light bulb goes out or whatever, he's the guy there that needs some work done on it, he's the guy who didn't. Thank you very much for doing that, Justin. As you may already know, I'm a very eclectic person, and Becky has gotten to be that way, and we have collected a lot of things, and, have a, and we're gonna let you have a tour of this thing, and look around, and there's all kinds of collections. If you look at those chairs, the wooden chairs you're sitting on, in the back of them, most of them will have a thing about the size of a penny, a little brass, deal on there that says BL Marble. Well, we got to chase on BL Marble chairs and they're made in Yorktown, well, no, in Yorktown, what town was it in Ohio? We even went there and saw the town. You know, like it's <laughs> we bought those chairs all over. But there's a lot of this stuff that we we bought from here to there and, and hauled in here in a station wagon. I think we did buy some stuff in Northern Iowa and, and Lori and Larry helped go up there to the trailer and haul it in, didn't they? <laughs> So, you're welcome to take a look. There's a unique thing in the back, back here that the abstract gals, uh, they think it's neat, but the youngest one is the one that gets to use it. If anybody wants to volunteer, why well, you can climb the ladder back there. But we made it. Have you ever seen the store with the ladder that rolled along? You know, well, we've got one back there and we use it. We've got shelves. It isn't very often we use it, but some of the old files on abstracts are up on the top of that. Wow. My office has I've got uh, stockyard stuff from, from several stockyards in there. There's furniture around, but uh, second floor is all apartments. Third floor is 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 vacant really. It's it's a big open area up there. Another thing we just did we just on those what kind of windows were there? I didn't know. Italian eight. I type. Mm -hmm. Well, did we mess them up by putting in new windows last <laughs> fall <laughs> or this summer? I mean, we just put some new windows in there. But feel free to get around and walk around. Any questions anybody's got? Oh, I got well, a I just one. one more thing. And yeah. thank you so much for all your research and Calvin and, and Dave for coming and everyone. But uh, we would like to give Weil the honor of unveiling the marker before the tour yeah. okay. begins. So. This is where, which, which is the best side here? There you go. Okay. Where is it going to go? It goes on the outside. Right side, Cheryl. Right side. Well, actually, Any other questions? Left side, left side, left side. It's really the only thing that came I just want to add, if I could. Yes, yes. I found an old article out of the Oscar Herald when he started this business. 
they thought he was nuts for starting a business like that in the 1930s. Yeah. yeah. I think the name of the heading of the article is The Courage of His Conviction. Yeah. yeah. Everybody <laughs> thought he was nuts. Yeah. 1932. Yeah. And aren't you from Coin, Iowa? Yes. And you're a stamp collector. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the the uh, what I liked about I, I, I'm very business oriented and lease and that kind of thing. I like it. I never was able. Like, the only lease rate I ever found was fifty dollars from Gerald Hesslinger that he paid on his his office up there. But like, what your dad paid for lease here? I, I would you know. And I asked Emily, and she you don't have any idea. You know. I asked I asked David Almond what his dad paid, you know, or whatever, and and you know because they did they did major overhaul. I mean. Yeah. He was talking about the Hubers coming in here, and they did major overhaul to these buildings. Well, and I know Dad did major overhaul. Yeah. This front door was, I mean, the article in the paper, this front door was moved several times. They set it back, and, you know, and of course it was two businesses, and then one, and then one thing or another. And, well, and then this awning out in front and the marble out, of that was not original. And I understand that now it's been on there long enough that it's part of historical stuff and you can't take it off. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> but it's not original. So. Okay, feel free to open the door for him, Justin. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Oh, one more quick thing. When you go down the hall, on the right side is the collection of the histories of the abstract companies here in town. And as you go down, they get older. Each one is a generation or so. And there's a lot of things right here too. I can see them looking here. I'm not sure what all those yeah. things are. Here, here's my favorite one. Yeah. Farmers oh, farmers. Exercise machine. Yeah. Well, you know what that is. Wash machine. Yeah. 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 So how do you do that?